from flesh to the point of death for the name of Jesus. Unbelievable. I, I read one story uh, that took place just a couple of weeks ago. It was heart, heart rending on the one hand, and on the other hand, it was convicting about a, uh, a pastor's family that was on the phone with an American missionary overseer of, of that area, and he was talking to his overseer as as they were, I guess, being accosted. I don't I don't know what the full detail was, but he heard the children in the background on the phone call saying, "Mama, I will die for Jesus." Children. Children, how does a child say something like that? I'll tell you how. By the spirit of the living God, not of himself. You don't have to be strong enough to die for Jesus. Jesus in you is strong enough to die for Jesus. Our, our oldest son, Chris, had a, uh, he had a dream several years back. He called and told me, he said, Dad, I had a dream, I want to tell you about it. He said he was standing in a long, 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 far as the eye could see, single file line of people. He said, and they were all moving toward this scene up ahead. And as he got closer, he realized it was a guillotine. He said, I got up near it. I'm watching all of these people that are dying and their heads are being cut off. And he said, I got right at the guillotine, and I'm thinking, I guess I'm next. And he said, Jesus stepped up, put his hand in front of me, and said, step out. I'm going to do this for you. You know, in that dream, Jesus wasn't, I don't believe, was saying, I'm fixing to get my head cut off so you don't have to. What he was saying was, I'm going to do this for you. Think about what I just said. I'm going to do this for you. I, I, I'm here, and it'll be me doing it so you don't have to worry about it. And we look at that, and we say, well, how can... People dying for Christ bring glory to him. The glory is in the fact that you can go there. Many, many people have been, and, and communities have been won to the Lord over the years throughout history because of somebody dying at martyr's death. That's, you can read about it in church history because of somebody dying at martyr's death. Well, how could God be in that? Well, let me, let me tell you something. You can only be afraid for so long and it only takes so long to die. And if God gets you through that, guess what? I got news for you. You are going to die anyway. We see things from these carnal eyes and what we think life ought to look like and be like and happen like. And it never does, does it? Has your life been what you thought it was going to be when you were 15 or 16 years old? Or have you faced things that you never would have dreamed you would have faced? And have you not, as a believer, said... At times, I don't get this, Lord. I've been serving you. I've been living for you. I love you. I'm a Christian. You know my life. And you've forgiven what was wrong, but you know <laughs> you know, I love you. Have you not thought these things at some point in your life? If you haven't, chances are you will. And yet Christ has been with you, and he's brought us to where we are today. And we are in him. Because eternity is a whole lot longer than this short 70, 80, 100 year life. Yeah, but sure, Philip. That's right. There you go. Yeah. So that's nothing that we need to deal with in this little bitty time that we have of eternity. That God wants us for. So, uh, but on the other side, the challenge is for a non-believer, somebody who's not a believer, this little bit of time is the best that's going to get us. This is the best that's going to get to us. That's where we're going to be safe. Did I get it? We can't. Thank you. Thank you.
That's good. Yeah, we can get so wrapped up in our life, in our little church, in our stuff, that we forget that we're here for another purpose, for a greater purpose. Jesus said that for this purpose I had come, to seek and save that which is lost. That's why Jesus came. John, uh, John, 1 John says this, For this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of the evil one. If Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, and he came to seek and save that which was lost, then we need to be actively seeking those that are lost and destroying the works of the evil one. How can we destroy the works of the evil one? Any comments? Leading people to Jesus and bringing them in, that destroys the works of the evil one. Getting sin and evil out of our own life. How's he working? Through people. So if we win people to the kingdom, he lost all of that power and effect he had through their lives. Unless we as believers are allowing ungodliness and evil to work out of our life. And then he's working there. We need to destroy that. Did you speak up? Yeah, please do. Yeah. You need a mic? I can't hear you, so I don't know if anybody. I, don't know if anybody. I, I know you don't want that, but go ahead. It says, For such a time as this, we are all brought into God's kingdom. People are scared, hopeless, angry, etc. They were watching and experiencing the world's kingdom begin to implode on them. What they were taught to be the way to live life is coming up very short. Hmm. We, as followers of Jesus Christ, have always carried the truth. The answer on how to live this life, even in the midst of a very broken world. God wants us to share with those who are lost his most excellent way we need to continue to share the gospel the good news of jesus christ with the compassion and the service jesus demonstrated to the lost we were all once lost and thank god we answered god's call we need to be about helping others to be reconciled back to god in the territory Amen. That's good. That's good. Goes right along with what Philip said. All right. Well, turn your Bibles to, eh, let's see where we're going to go today. Anybody have a favorite verse you want to turn to? No. Okay. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, the scripture we've been talking about. So I'm still on the mind of Christ, having the mind of Christ. If we can learn to think like God thinks, life would go a whole lot better for us, wouldn't it? We need to learn to think and to process like God thinks. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse 9, I'll start there and read a couple of verses. Just to kind of get back on track, We're just, I'm just... Just following what, you know, I keep saying I'm going to do the ten things that Jesus thought. And I've done that, this will be the fifth time. And so I'm not going to make it there today either. It, every time I start doing this, I keep finding more stuff that I'm like, no, that really needs to be said. And that needs to be said. So I just want to bear with you. I, we're, just, we're just going through this idea together. That we have the potential to think God thoughts. We are not God, and I hate to have to be so simple and clear on that, but our culture today in many ranks says that we are gods. The New Age movement, uh, you get off into your various different cults and things, they claim to be God themselves, and they're, they're well, the New Age movement, for instance, would say that they are uh, ascending to a higher stage of consciousness. That they're going to reach a higher level, and eventually they'll reach a level where a level of realization that they're God. And once they reach that level of realization that they are gods, they will then have the power to be a god. And so the Mormon Church, for instance, 
The Mormons believe there are three stairways to heaven. They can choose which one they want to climb. They are, they are, they're made up of different uh, things to do. And if you do these things, you'll go up that particular stairwell. And the highest stairwell is the stairwell to heaven. And, and these are not difficult things. They're like knocking on doors, riding bicycles with a white shirt and, and uh, witnessing. And I mean, it's just the things that they do. And it's, the way, it's a way that they manipulate people to get them to do what they want them to do in the church. Well, you can, you can go up this meager path or you can go up the difficult path and stairwell, stairway. And you can, when you get to the top, you will become a god. So what the Mormon, Mormon church teaches you, I don't, teaches, I don't know if you know that or not. Uh, and on and on it goes. And so, but we are not gods. Now Jesus said, did not the, the uh, psalmist say, ye are gods? Jesus said that, and the psalmist said it, ye are gods. But it's a small g. In no way can we ever be an equal with God, the creator. In the small g, it means that you have power and authority over your own life. And that's as far as it goes. But that power and authority is to be submitted and surrendered to the power and authority of the Creator who made us. But He's given us the right to live our life the way we want to live it. Right? But it's not to our benefit to try to be God. We are not God. Somebody needs to shout me down. While I try to get this iPad back on. Okay? So listen to this. Uh, verse, well, let's just look at verse, verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We have not begun to comprehend, he's saying in our human nature, the stuff that God has prepared for us. We don't get it. We don't get it. God has prepared things for us that would blow our mind if we got it. Now, watch this. Watch the next one now. But God has revealed them to us. Everybody say, oh, I do get it. Come on. Nobody got it, so let's do it again. Say, oh, I do get it. He said God has revealed them to us through his spirit. So when we come to Christ, we meet the Lord, we become believers, we become followers of Christ. His spirit, the Bible says, comes to dwell in us. If it's his spirit living in us, and his spirit is, and, and we submitted our will and our thoughts and our mind to him, then verse 16 says this, but we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ because the spirit has, has given us the capacity to think like God thinks. So, listen to these little quotes here. Thoughts are not dormant, but alive. Thoughts are not dormant, but they're alive. They issue from the depths of a living soul and manifest in the actions of one's body. Thoughts are not dormant. We, we think, well, I just think all the time. I think stuff, you know. We don't even think about what we're thinking about. We really don't. And, 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 but those thoughts are not dormant. They're all affecting the way we live our lives. And we got to get this. To think you go through the day thinking stuff and it's insignificant is not accurate. They issue from the depths of a living soul. Thoughts come from the depths of our soul, right? And they manifest in the actions of one's body. Number two, thoughts are the spark of our intentions. What we think sparks is the spark, is the, the igniter of what our intention is. Next one. Our thoughts ignite our choices in life, charting the course for its ultimate outcome. What you are today is the product of your thought life yesterday. Whatever we thought on in the past has brought us to where we are today. So if thoughts have that kind of power, our thinking have that kind of power, then we need to learn how to rein our thoughts in and think the way God thinks. Can you say amen to that? Okay. I knew you could. Okay. So what are your thoughts constructing in your life? Are they pleasant or pressing? Are they productive or are your thoughts destructive? 
Are they calming? They calm you down? Or are they more disturbing? Are your thoughts life-giving? Or are your thoughts crushing? What are you thinking throughout the week, throughout the day? Are your thoughts selfish? Or are they considerate of others? Are they moving you toward God or are they driving you away from God? Are you thinking with me? Do you think on the success and the blessings promised to us by God? Or do you wrestle with doubt and lack from overthinking your circumstances and your problems? Just in those little thoughts, if it kind of opens our thinking. Getting a little uh, repetitive there. But just those little things kind of open our thinking up to how much we can affect change in our lives if we can learn to change our thinking. If we can change our thinking. And so the point is, the more we think like God thinks, the more like Him we become. But there's a dilemma, and the dilemma is this. We don't just entertain pointless thoughts, but our thoughts are the product of who we are at the heart of our soul. We don't just entertain pointless thoughts. They, our thoughts are the product of who we are in our heart. We don't ponder, get this, we don't ponder what comes to us. We ponder what comes from us. I wish I could get these thoughts out of my mind. Okay, let me, let me say this first. I wish I could get these bad thoughts out of my mind. I just can't get them there. I, I keep thinking on this. I keep thinking on what that person did to me. I keep thinking on that mistake I made. I keep thinking on, on uh, what a loser I am. <laughs> I keep thinking on whatever it is that's negative. We don't ponder what comes to us as much as we ponder what comes from us. And in other words, you can't blame your thinking on outward circumstances or other people. Although that's what we, the way we justify maintaining a negative thought life. It's always somebody else's fault. How many of you know, if you know somebody who's always negative, always blaming, and they, they always blame is where I'm headed with that. If you know somebody who's always negative, it's always someone else's fault. You can't, you can't try to share with them how to get out of their gutter without them saying, yeah, but so-and-so. Yeah, but you didn't grow up like I did. I've heard all this stuff in counseling for 100 years. Huh? Yeah, but, you know, the way I, what, what my daddy did to me, what my mother, and I know it was bad, and I'm not, nobody's arguing it was terrible, but you're not pondering what happened to you any longer after a course of time. You now are pondering what's happened in you, what it did inside of you, how it affected you, and, and what you allowed it to do to you. And that allowance comes from our choices. I, 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 listen, I've, I've known a lot of people, and you probably have too. I've known people who had gone through the most horrendous things as their child, in their childhood, but were living the most victorious life of people, other people that I knew. And I've known people who'd gone through things that were somewhat bad and wouldn't let go of it, and their life was a wreck because they were still struggling, and they hadn't let go of those things. They weren't willing to let go of them. Does that make sense? We don't ponder what comes to us. We ponder what comes from us. The Bible teaches these things. In, in, uh, well, the things that we meditate on originate from our own heart, not our head. Now watch this. Proverbs 23, 7. This is a real familiar verse, but watch it. For as a man thinks, so is he. As a man thinks, so is he. See, it's what I'm thinking that tells what I am. Did you get that? As a man thinks, so is he. Okay, let's do another one. Luke 6.45, <laughs> Jesus said this, the good person. How many good people do we have? Say amen. Raise your hand real high. Just go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead. I'm a good person. You are a good person in Christ. The good person, out of the good treasures of his heart, brings forth what is good. 
Did you get that? Where do good people get all this good stuff to say? How do good people just be so good to people? How is it some people just, <laughs> you know, Tyler? <laughs> Come on now, you can't argue that. <laughs> if you know Tyler, you know a good person. Is Tyler in here? There you are. If you know Tyler, you know a good person. I told Lori one day, I said, I have never heard anything negative come out of that guy's mouth. He does not need to spend much time with me. I'm just saying, he is so pure-hearted. He, where does all that good come from, Tyler? See there, here it comes. Here it goes. You can, you, can, you can see Tyler's post on Facebook any day of the week. He'll be posting, you know, things that God's given him, and he's, he's speaking and sharing blogs or whatever. He'll be toasting, posting about he's, a, he's, a radio, he's an announcer for wrestling, professional wrestling kind of stuff. Or, and uh, it's tremendous at it. And, it. and you won't see any post of his that doesn't end with, I'd just like to give thanks to all. He starts naming all the people in the world, you know. Why? Because... Good things come from good people's good heart. He, he ponders all these things to be thankful for because his heart is good. But when your heart is hardened and black and damaged, it, it, has not, it can find nothing to be thankful for, though it may be in the midst of living in the greatest country in the world at the greatest time in the history of the earth, with the greatest medical treatments, the best music, yeah, the best, most, the greatest opportunities ever, the least crime a nation has ever seen in the history of the world has been our country. I know things are changing. We're not talking about that right now. I'm talking about people, we live in a time, we are blessed to be here in every way. Everything about our lives is blessed, and yes, there are bad things that come, but if you've got a good heart, out of the good heart, you're going to explode with the good things. So what do you do? James, uh, Paul said this. Or James, I think it was, said this. Think on these things. It was Paul said in Philippians. Think on these things. Things that are good. Things that are lovely. Things that are just. Things that are of good report. Things that are a good report. Not on the coming disaster of the vaccination and COVID. And all the things that we're that are bombarding us from the outside. But if we have a heart that trusts God, it's going to reject that stuff and say and, and, and give us direction. So here we go. So watch this. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. The evil person out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks that which fills his heart. So, in order to think more like God, we need to love more like God. God is love, the Bible says. So, if we want to learn to think the thoughts of God, if we want to have the mind of Christ, we have to learn to love people. If I love you with all of my heart and you do something uh, terrible, rather than hating you for that act, my heart is going to be broken for you. Rather than judging you, my heart is going to be broken. And I'm going to want to help you. I'm gonna, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to want to help you because I love you rather than punish you. Out of the good treasure of a good heart, there's mercy and justice and forgiving and long-suffering and patience and kindness. I'm quoting the fruits of the Spirit. Right? So in a good heart is the fruit of the Spirit, and it reacts to bad things with good thing, with good reactions. And so if we want to Think more like God, who is love. We need to learn to love more like God, and we'll think like He does. And get this: like 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 Him, our love is under our control. Uh, scripture says that. Uh, well, I'll read to you Romans five five. It says now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in the hearts in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. It's a scripture in there, in, in a, a, a text in Romans where he says, you know, 
He's talking about the goodness of God and the mercy of God. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. While we were doing bad, God did good for us. Let me say it again. While we were doing bad, from the heart of God, he sent his son to die for us. Are you, are you, are you paralleling that with what I said a while ago? Okay? In that same context, he says that. Hope does not disappoint to hope in his love and his forgiveness. Because the love of God has been poured out in the hearts of men by the Holy Spirit. God's love has been poured in. Once you've come to know Christ, he pours his love in your heart. And then he backs up and says, now it's yours to do with as you wish. Your love is under your control. You, you can become bitter and unproductive in that. Or you can take that love and open your heart and begin to love others. And begin to be good to those who are bad to you. What's that scripture you quote a lot? He is good and kind to those who are unfaithful. God is, how does it go? She would know it any day of the week unless I put her on the spot. Yeah, she quotes this occasionally. He is good to the unthankful and unholy. unholy. God is good to the unthankful and unholy. I'm going to tell you, if there's anybody it's hard to be good to, it's the unthankful. Is my telling the truth? You do something for somebody, or you're kind to them, you're good to them, they turn around and, what? Every once in a while you get a cashier like that. You know, right now the uh, uh, fast food industry is scrapping for employees. And uh, I've had some encounters with a few of them lately. It's like, they hired you to sit at this window <laughs> with the public? Y'all know what I'm saying? And the fact is, they can't find anybody else. But, you know, you're, you come up, and I'm, I'm, I always make jokes, and I cut up. And, I, I, you know, here's the truth. I know I'm old. Here's evidence that I'm old. The younger people are, the less they laugh at any of my humor. They don't get my humor. He, they'll just look at me like, yo, old man, shut up. And uh, it's hard to be good to those that are unthankful. But God is good to the unthankful and the unholy. When he's given them the opportunity to be holy, to be righteous, to live a good life, to be good to people. To live, to, to live good, and they choose not to, and they're not grateful for all that he's offered them, God's going to be good to them anyway. But we don't think that way. We think God's fixing to come slap me on the back of the head because I didn't do good this time. But God is good to the unthankful and the unholy. I'm preaching to myself today. I know this is not for any of y'all. Somebody I was talking to recently uh, who's going through some really difficult stuff. I was kind of talking along those lines. And, and, uh, and, and, and it was said to me, so then how do we change what's in our heart? How do we change what's in our heart? It's like he got what I said, that change comes from the heart. The mind r ruminates on what comes from the heart. He said, so how do we change what's in our heart? He just stopped in his tracks. So all of a sudden, he got it. And what he got was, he didn't know how to change. And he said to me, he said, I've tried that so many times, and I just can't change. He said, I set my mind that I'm going to change, and I start trying to think right now. He said, it just doesn't happen. So how do we change what's in our heart, he asked. And I said, the answer is this simple. We don't let, we don't, we don't, we don't change. We let God have our heart, and he makes it into something different. We don't change. If your mind is full of negativity and evil and whatever, and you don't like that, and it's a dark place, and you want to get out of it, and you've tried to change, and you can't, the reason is you've not given your heart because right here is where the good treasure has to come from. If the good treasure is not here, it's not going to gravitate up to here. There's just going to be more of what is there coming up until that is ripped out and changed. 
It's got to be changed. God alone can bring that kind of change. So you can deal, you can, you can deal with somebody who's been abused and try to help them, but you can't help them until they're willing to give their heart to God. You can talk to an addict all day long and tell them, do steps 1 through 10 and you'll be free enough to live a life. But you might as well go ahead and say, my name is Fred, I'm an alcoholic, because you're going to be one the rest of your life. That's what they tell them. When we had our drug recovery center here, the first thing that I said to the guys that came into the program, when they would come in, we had 180-something guys come into that program. I made it a goal to tell every one of them, one of the first things I would say when they come in is this. You're not in Alcoholics Anonymous, and you're not in, in uh, Narcotics Anonymous, or whatever they call them. You are in the church. And in the kingdom of God, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So you will never say in this program, my name is Fred, I'm an alcoholic. Because if you say you're an alcoholic, you're an alcoholic. But if you get free in Christ, and let me tell you, I've had Christian people fight me over this like you wouldn't believe. I'm not talking about the ones that had addictions. I'm talking about those that didn't have addictions. People had rather believe science than believe the truth of the Word of God. You say, whoa, wait, that don't make sense. Science is fact. Not always. There's false stuff. And, and, and the ten steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, that's not science anyway. That's, it's a religion. I don't know if you get that or not, if you're familiar with it at all. It's a religion. Also, it's a book. It's a Bible. It's just a different way of approach. It's not approaching the living God. It's approaching whatever God you choose. They'll tell you your tree can be your God. You know? That, they will. They'll tell you whatever you want to be God can be your God, but you've got to have a God. That's what you're told in Alcoholics Anonymous. And they come in here and I say, you got one God. His name is Jehovah. The Lord our God is one God. And His Son is Jesus Christ. And they are the only true God. And they're the living God. And if you'll come to the living God, the living God can set you free. Because the truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If I get up every week and I say I'm an alcoholic, my name is Daryl Martin, I'm an alcoholic, but I got my blue chip, well, I'm still an alcoholic. Because a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What's in your heart goes up to your head. And so I may be clean for 30 years and drive by the fuzzy duck and I'm still wanting a bottle because I'm telling myself I'm an alcoholic. And I may have to abstain going to public parties and things because they're going to be serving alcohol there, and I'm an alcoholic, and I can't be around that 30 years later. Listen, it's not right. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Is there anybody in here that used to have a sin problem? You don't have it anymore. I mean, the temptation's gone too. Right? The rest of you do, and you're just not thinking about what it is. I can promise you that. So... He makes us new. He recreates us. The Bible says, Behold, all things pass away, all things become new. That old heart becomes new. He re recreates it. He regenerates it. And he restores everything that the enemy has stolen from us. In the book of Ezekiel, and what am I looking like on time? In the book of Ezekiel, here's a, this is a scripture that Daisy often will quote from. And uh, So turn to Ezekiel in your Bible, and I want to look at a few verses here. And uh, and then I'm going to close after that, okay? Everybody say good. This is where God is showing what he's going to do for his people, Israel. Israel were an interesting people. They were God's chosen people. He chose them not because there was something special about them. He chose them because Abraham believed in him. And God was looking for someone who would believe in him that he could then give offspring to so he could create a nation of people who would believe in him. So we refer to him as Father Abraham. And so God chose the Israelis to be the people who would carry the message of the living God to all of the earth. 
It was not intended to stay with the Jews. It was intended that the Jews be the example to the world that God cared for humanity and the way he took care of them, blessed them, and, and, and his presence with them. And the Ark of the Covenant, his presence was visible with fire at, at night and a cloud by day. And God was trying to demonstrate to the whole world that I care about people, but he had to have a people who believed in him that he could do it through. Okay, But Israel had a problem, and the problem was they were human beings. <laughs> and in being human beings, they had the carnal nature that we all have when we were born, the fallen nature, because of the sin of Adam. <laughs> and so they struggled with things, and they would go away and chase. They would, they would let things go through their mind and their thinking and their processing that they wanted until they wanted it more than they wanted to please the God that loved them. And they thought they could do better for themselves than God could do. And so they would chase after the world, right? They went after other idols. They worshipped other idols. They went after harlotry. They married into other nations. They, they, they let everything that God had called them to be and to do all fall by the wasteland, wasteline, and as a result, they were taken up and carried away captive into another nation where they became slaves. And that's a picture of sin in our lives today. If we chase after the things of the world that our flesh wants, but we know are contrary to the will of God, they will take us into captivity, and we'll become enslaved to that. It may be called an addiction, it may whatever you want to call it, but it's 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 a, you can call it a habit if you want to ease the pain. But it's an addiction, and it's an addiction to sin, not to drugs, and not to alcohol, and not to harlotry, and not to anger, and not to uh, control, and not to all the different things that we become enslaved by. It's an addiction to sin. And God sees it, and what God sees is when that's in the church, it says to the whole world out there, I can't even handle my own people. Why would they need me? And it's a disgrace to God. And God feels that disgrace. Did you know that? Well, so look at Ezekiel, and watch what he says about it. Y'all need a chapter, huh? 36. Chapter 36. Well, can you maybe pull that up on the screen for us? Thirty-six, sixteen. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled... They defiled it by their own ways and their deeds. <laughs> to me, he says, their deeds, uh, to me, their way was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. Filthy. Therefore, I poured out my fury on them. For the blood that they had shed on the land and for their idols which they had defiled with, with which they had defiled it. So I scattered them among the nations. And they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. How many of you know the Jews live all around the globe? And they've been trying to get home ever since they were scattered around the globe, just like he said he was going to do. When they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name. There it is. They profaned his name. When they said of them, when the nation said of them. Now, when the other people said about the Jews who God had scattered because of their wickedness, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they've gone out of his land. They knew it wasn't supposed to be that way. But I had concern for my holy name, God said, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. God said, 
that he's about to restore him. He said, but first I want you to know this. He said, I'm not doing this for your benefit. He said, I'm doing it for what you did to my name. I'm going to bring you back and restore you for what you did to my name. So hold that thought. That sounds like, well, that's not the nature of God. Well, hold that thought. Verse 23. He says, and I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in your midst, in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God. There are 13 times in the next several verses where he says, I will. When God decides he will, guess what? He will. And so his will is not always understandable to us. Here these people were still living in their, in their ungodliness and their wickedness. And God sees them, and he says, look, y'all are disgracing me. You remember, you used to hear people, daddies would tell their kids when they were acting riotous and crazy, you're ruining your family name. Y'all remember that? You don't hear that much anymore. But that's what God was saying. You've disgraced your family name. And because you did... And everything that's going on and what it's done to my reputation. This is God saying this. He says, I will. There's the first I will. He said, I will. Look at verse 23. And I will sanctify my great name. I'm going to make it holy again. Which has been profaned among the nations. Which you have prof uh, profaned in their midst. Christian hypocrites today, if you would. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord says the Lord God. When I am hollowed in you before their eyes, for I will, everybody say I will. Whenever I say I will, say I will. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and bring you, and bring you into your own land. Now that started happening in 1948 when Israel became a nation again. Uh, Russia has dumped out Thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of Jews. Jews from America have moved back. Jews from all over the world are starting to move back. And Israel's been restored. He says, listen to the things he says he's going to do to save his name. Number one, he said, I'm going to gather you from the nations. I'm going to bring you home. Then he said, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. Next I will. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Remember what, we said, what I'm saying right here. What we're talking about is this. What comes from the heart is what you're thinking on. You're not thinking on just what happened out there. That may initiate thought, but what happens with that thought depends upon the treasure of your heart. Is it good or is it bad? Does it have the capacity to forgive? Or does it have the, uh, potent the propensity, I guess, to do evil and to lash back and to strike out and to be bitter and to be unforgiving. Okay? He says, but I'm going to put a new heart in you. And I'm going to put a new spirit within you. And I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh, that old bitter, hard, angry, self-defiant, and give you a heart of flesh, he said. I will put my spirit within you and I'll cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my statutes and do them. And then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. He's going to bring them back, right? He said, you're going to dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And I will, say I will, be a God, be your God. And I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. And I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields so that you never, so that you need never again to bear reproach of the famine among your nations. And then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that you were not good. Hello? God says, I'm going to do all this good stuff to save my own name. And then you're going to recognize and remember that you weren't good. Wait now. Like they say on Facebook, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Then you will remember, verse 31, your evil ways and your deeds 
that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. That's your sins. Not for your sake do I do this, says the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all of your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by it. So they will say, this land of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by it. So, uh, I jumped screen. so they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. And that is Israel today, right? Uh, in 1948, they said you couldn't grow a stick in Israel. Today, it's, it's the largest supplier of, of uh, produce, some, some particular type of produce in the world. It's become like the Garden of Eden, just like God said he was going to do. This is talking about them, and it's what he did with them. Verse 36, Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it. I will do it. Thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their men like a flock like a flock offered as holy uh, sacrifices, like the flock of Jerusalem on its feast days, so shall the ruined cities be filled with the flock of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So God says he's going to do all these things for his name. So what I'm talking about is everything, and I'm, I'm winding this up now, everything that God does, because God is love, comes from a heart of love. So even if God says, I'm going to do this for my own name, it came from his heart of love for them. Because he's love. His heart is nothing but love. It's nothing but good. So nothing but good can come out of his heart. And so you say, well, what about all the peoples that he's judged and he's killed? and, how, and all? That came from a heart of love. If somebody rapes your daughter and nobody punishes them, do they... Does, does anybody care about you? When you go to court and the judge says this person is to be imprisoned or whatever, is that not a demonstration? Is justice not a demonstration of love? If God didn't love us, he would have no rules, no laws. You can do whatever you want. If you make it to heaven, good for you. And if you don't, too bad. Go to hell. But God is a God of love, so he has to be a God of principle. And as a God of principle, there has to be judgment. There has to be a justice system. There has to be perimeters. There, it has to be explained to us that if you cross the line, there's punishment. There's danger. Don't go there. I love you. Don't go there. And so, God's, and so they just disobeyed God. He gave them the law. They had the law. They disobeyed it. They did what they wanted to do. They were kicked out of their own land. They were taken captive. Some of them scattered. And they got out there, and they were Jewish people living in Gentile nations and wanting to look like Gentiles. So they start living like the Gentiles live. And the Gentiles said, what are y'all doing? Y'all not like us. Why are you out here doing this? Your God is a farce. Right? And so that's what happens with the church today. We've got all these people in America that call themselves Christians, which, by the way, I heard this week is not all these people anymore. When I came here 20 years ago, the statistic was that 60 to 70% of Americans were professing Christians, and 40% of them professed to be born-again believers in Christ. I heard this week that that statistic is down to 20%. People don't confess Christ anymore. People are getting away from Him. They're going after the world. They're leaving the church. They're wanting to do their own thing. And they're going into sin and captivity when they do that. And so we see what's happening to our nation as a result of the people of God not living the life they're supposed to live as in the example they're supposed to give to the world from the church. And so the Jews got out there and, they, and, they, and the nation said, I don't, you know, you guys are, th are, are, are those people, the people of, of your God, and apparently it's not legit. So I just want to tell you real quick how that applies to us. We've got... As believers, we've been given the mind of Christ. 
we had the ability to cast down vain imaginations and take every evil thought captive and get it out of our life so that we can live the example of Christ that we're supposed to live. And the world will see that, and as, as our brother said, we can win them to Christ. And Jesus becomes the king that he is rightfully, right? So watch this. Real quick, these are the things that he said he was going to do to them that, he, that he's saying to the church. Watch this. He said, I will do these things. Number one, he's going to sanctify his name. He's going to sanctify his name. Don't worry if you don't feel good enough. He's doing it for himself. So when you say, well, I'm just not good enough to serve God, don't worry about all that. He's doing this for himself. He's going to, he's going to sanctify his name. Number two, he said I will, he would come and get us and bring us back to where we started. We wander from goodness, from the goodness of his land when we sin. He said, I'm going to come back and get you where you're at. We don't have to be good enough and, and get on our hands and knees and crawl our way back to God. He said, I'm coming after you because i got a great name. i got to save it. Y'all messed up, but I'm fixing to save it. There's going to be an end-time revival that's coming, and he's coming after us. And it needs to start in the church. Right? He said, number three, I'll cleanse away your filth and your idols. I'll cleanse away your filth and your idols. What are your idols? They're everything that you want more than you want, God. And I say you. I'm always in the you. Y'all understand that. But he said, I'm going to cleanse away your filth and your idols. Your filth, you can say, is evidenced by our shame over the way we live when we know we're not pleasing to God. Number four, he's, he's going to put a new heart in us and a new spirit. He's going to take out a stony heart that has a real hard time really even wanting to please God and put in a heart of flesh that's just like that little child who's got the new, fresh love for life. Back to those grandbabies of mine. They just love, 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 love. And that's what God wants us to be. He said, come to him like a little child. He's going to put a heart of flesh back in us if we will let him do that. He's going to take out a heart of stone. He will deliver us, number seven, from our sin. That's important because, again, the problem is we can't deliver ourselves from our sin. Because we can't die for our sin because we're already spiritually cut off from him before we meet him. But when we come to him, he puts a spirit in us. He delivers us from the vices of sin. Number eight, and there's only ten of these, he said he would bless our crops, the fruit of our labor. He's going to, when he restores the church, when he restores us individually to him, he also begins to restore everything that the canker worm had eaten, destroyed all the fruit of our labor, destroyed all of the goodness that he had given us and things like that. He says, I'm going to restore all of that. He said, I'm going to cause your, your fruit and your grain to increase greatly. Lori and I planted our first raised garden this year, and it was the biggest disappointment in my life. <laughs> it did grow a lot of tomatoes and beans and, and, and uh, watermelons and, and uh, squash and cantaloupe. And none of them got any bigger than a circle, than a <laughs> size of a 50 cent piece. But they're out there. If y'all want to eat, go on over and have some. Uh, but when you depend on your crops for life, it's everything to you, and it was to them. And God said, look, you, you've had a hard time even living because of your sin. And sin, when it eats, it, 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 it eats everything. And it destroys the economy of nations that go away from God. When nations veer from God, their economy goes south. Think about that. Uh, number nine. He said, I will enable you. This is cool. I will enable you to dwell in the cities and to re rebuild their ruins. I will enable you to come back to where you're supposed to be with him. And rebuild everything that you lost. And the last one, he said, 
let the, I'm going to let the house of Israel inquire of me. I'm going to let them come ask me. He said, and I'm going to increase, increase. I'm going to increase their men like a flock. So that's obviously a reference to the church. He's talking about revival. He said, I'm going to let the church come back to me, and they're going to ask me, and I'm going to begin to send souls in. I want to increase their flock. That's, that's that last, last day end time revival that we're looking at. The church may be on the, on, on the outside. It may be looking like we're dwindling, but we're, we're really getting suppressed like a spring. And when God takes the lid off, this thing's going to blow up. And uh, it's, it's, it's always been that way through history. Church gets pushed down through oppression, through uh, tribulation, because of her own sins or whatever. And then revival comes and boom, it's big. And God does great things. So that's what's going to happen. So stand up, turn to your neighbor and say, I think you need to think better. And that's for all.